Hi everyone, I'm Megler. I like to make stuff and this is Megler Makes. Lately in my social feeds, I've been seeing people saying they want to run away to a cabin in the woods and never come back. Maybe not this one. Probably something like this. More pastoral, less murdery. I don't have the friends who would own a cabin like that, nor the funds to buy one, so I decided to make one that I could visit in my imagination. I'm using one of these little plastic cloche tchotchkes I found at Ikea. Step one is getting this sucker open. It's glued shut with surprisingly strong glue. You can see where I initially tried to drill a hole in it so I could pry it open. Didn't work, but it is marking the back of the thing, so I'll call that a time saver. I thought soaking it in hot water might loosen it, so I pulled my cutting mat out of the way so as not to warp it, and put my stupidly expensive decorative cutting board down as a heatsink. Why ruin one expensive thing when you can ruin something even more expensive, right? On top of the cutting board, I put a pan of boiling water to soak the base of my clothes in. Channeling the craftsman, I wore me some gloves to protect my hands and give myself a little bit better grip. Into the hot bath it goes for a nice steam. One one thousand, two one thousand, three one thousand. After a few more seconds, I pulled it out and tried to open it again with a similar lack of results. I repeated that process a few more times because surely, if it doesn't work the first time, it will obviously work the third time, right? It was around this point when I realized a different approach was needed. As my old man says, if at first you don't succeed, switch to power tools. I pulled out my wee little Dremel with a grinding wheel on it and some safety glasses. I prefer my safety glasses to be speckled with paint so I can't see what I'm doing, but that's just me. You do you. I also put on a dust mask. You're probably going to want something with a better filter, but for one short use, it'll be fine, right? I then proceeded to just grind away at the seam, trying to open it up. When that didn't work, I switched to good old brute force. And tried a saw, because why not? Back to more brute force, apply enough pressure, and everything eventually opens, right? Next, I tried a bigger screwdriver, which actually worked. <coughs> Until it broke. <coughs> it was okay though, because it broke at what I had already determined was the back of the piece so I could turn it towards the wall and not but you untold thousands of YouTube viewers would ever see it. After a quick repair job on the base, it was time to check out what was under that dome. A little plastic hill with some flocking and fake plants. On their own, fake plants are hella expensive for some reason, so I'm going to save those for later use. Denuded of its foliage, we're left with this kind of sad looking little hill. I suppose that it would pass for a grassy knoll if you didn't look too closely at it, but it really needs some extra grass to be something special. I'm going to spray my little hill down with some watered down Mod Podge to get the grass to stick. Or I'm going to brush it on because someone let it dry out and clog the sprayer. This actually worked out a little bit better though because the brush gave me more control over where I was putting my stick on and ultimately where my grass would end up. Figuring that the tiny people who lived in this cottage weren't so big on yard work, I painted around a little clearing where the house will go and got to adding my grass. If you know, you know, but if you don't know, this is called static grass. It's usually applied with an applicator that creates a little static charge that makes all the tiny blades of grass stand up, just like real grass would. If, like me, you don't have a static grass applicator, you can just sprinkle it on like the world's least exciting glitter. Because grass isn't just one shade of green, I used a couple shades to add that old spice to life. Once the glue dries, the grass I added will blend right in with the existing flocking, looking like it was there all the time. Next, I needed to give my tiny people a path to get into their literal tiny house. I've got some fine gravel in two colors, again, to give it that spice, and I mixed them together to give it a more homogenous look. Making sure I get my hand in the way of the shot, I laid down a layer of tacky glue and spread it out into a path-like shape with my paintbrush. These rocks are made for rolling, so they need the extra tackiness to make sure they go exactly where I want them. I take it back, this is the world's least exciting glitter. When I was done, I tapped off the excess to save because tiny rocks are also hella expensive. While it was drying, I started in on my little cabin. I wadded up some aluminum foil for the armature and realized almost immediately that I had way too much foil for the size house I wanted. 
There, that's better. After smooshing and squishing it into a vaguely house-like shape, I started covering it with sheets of the disturbingly fleshy pink Super Sculpey. I left the bottom of the house uncovered because, as I often do in the middle of a project, I increased the scope of it to include a little light in the house that would look like a fire. Then it was just a matter of making it look less like a little unsettling pink blob and more like a cabin, which I did with various sculpting tools. I did a quick dry fit to make sure the size of the base hadn't increased, I guess, and kept sculpting until I was happy with it. I then spent a very long time making a river rock chimney for my tiny people because they fancy, I guess. In hindsight, I probably could have gotten away with sculpting just the top of the chimney because thanks to my earlier unknown brute strength, no one was ever going to see the result of me spending hours rolling out tiny clay stones. With the chimney that no one will see complete, I decided to put a little thatched roof on my cabin, making it look more like a cottage. I used my pointy sculpting tool to scratch tiny lines into the roof of my cabin, simulating layers of straw before carving out a tiny window and door to make it easier to see the flickering firelight within. As you're doing this, don't forget to use your giant sausage fingers to squish all those fine details you put into the roof and chimney. You can't have a cabin in the woods without the woods, so it was time to make some trees. I measured out some wire using the tallest fake plant that came with the cloche as a guide and bunched it up into a little bundle. Then, half on, half off camera, I loaded that little bundle into my drill, held on to one end with my pliers and let it rip. There's something I find very satisfying about that, but then I'm easily amused. Once you have your little metal stick, snip the loops of wire and spread them out to look like branches. The hardest part of this process will be convincing your obsessive brain not to make them neat and even and symmetrical, because trees don't grow like that. Once you've finished one tree, just, it's just rinse and repeat for the others. I did a test fit to realize I'd much rather put a tree in a new hole I had to make rather than using one of the existing holes. I shoved the wires into the base, and then it was time to put some bark on those trees. I've seen people just paint the wire, but that wasn't really the look I was going for, so I wrapped more Sculpey around the trunk of each tree, smooshing it into place. I then took my pointy tool again and scribed some lines into the trunk to make it look more like fleshy pink bark. Rinse and repeat again until you have the beginnings of a tiny, tiny forest. Next, I brushed everybody down with a light coating of isopropyl alcohol. This melts away fingerprints and gets rid of those little shaggy bits of clay from when I scratched all those tiny lines into the piece. It's helpful if you use a cup that leaks just so you can get a really good mess going. After their little sponge bath, all the pieces go into the oven at 275 degrees Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes. While things were baking, I used an X-Acto knife to cut another hole I didn't need to cut into the base of my little hill for the tea light that would become the fire in my little cabin. There was probably an easier and safer way to do this, but as I always say, if there's no immediate risk of serious injury, are you really even crafting at all? An excessive amount of hot glue holds this little light in place. When it dries, it's time to get to work on pulling all of that aluminum foil out of the bottom of the cabin. This was an incredibly delicate and tedious process. I didn't want to crush my little cabin with my impressive bear strength, and the foil was actually packed in there pretty tightly. Using tiny needle nose pliers, because I didn't dare use anything else, I was able to painstakingly pull out pieces that were about a quarter of an inch in size at one at a time until... One eternity later. It was time for paint. I used acrylics here, and I find that the lighter colors, like the straw color I'm going for on the roof, tend to not cover well the first time. So I did a base coat of white and mixed my yellow right on top of it. It looks pretty bright at this stage, but don't worry, I'll mess it up later. I also did the first light gray layer of paint on the chimney you won't ever see. That all needed a hot second to dry before I could go on to the next step, so I painted the trunks of the trees. I used a coffee brown and black and purposely left them a little translucent so I could build up the color. I let the trees dry, and then came my favorite time in any painting project. Grime time! That's right, folks, the mediocre painter's first best friend, black wash. Mine's not fancy. I just soak the piece in watered down black paint, which I then wipe off with the grungiest rag in the house I can find. 
Then it's time to call in the mediocre painter's second best friend, dry brushing. With a dry brush, hence the name, I gently apply just the barest fairy's whisper of white paint onto areas of the sculpture that I want highlighted. It brings out all the sticky uppy bits while all the layy downy bits stay dark, giving you some natural and low effort contrast. I then painted the walls of the cabin a nice dark brown, assuming that my tiny people would not have access to the vibrant colors of paint out in the woods. After a little more dry brushing, because I can't help myself, I ended up making my cabin look like it was perpetually caught on a frosty winter's morn. Well, I've got nothing against winter, it wasn't the look I was going for, so some more black wash will drag it back to the other side of too much. I like to go back and forth with my overdoing things until it finally settles out close to where I really wanted it. Next, I'll dry brush the tree trunks to give them a little depth and shadow as well. To disguise the LED bulb of the electric tea light, I cut out a little square of tracing paper and glued it inside the house. Next, it was time to put leaves on the trees. I originally had a loose idea about carving down some green foam and gluing clump foliage onto it to look like a leafy canopy. But as the eagle-eyed among you watching the top of the frame will see, that idea resulted in a bizarre Seussian nightmare that I ended up not using after all. Dejected at my failure, I sat there puttering about with it for a few minutes until I got the bright idea to just spear little bits of clump foliage onto the wires of the tree branches. To my surprise, this actually looked pretty good, so that's what I went with. Did I film any of that process? Nope. No, I did not. To keep the spongy clump foliage in place, I got my little sprayer working and soaked the trees down with that watered-down Mod Podge I was using earlier. I filled in any gaps with some bits of foliage that I tediously applied with tacky glue. With the little trees sufficiently fluffed out, I did another dry fit of where I wanted the house, trees, and bushes to go. This is a very organic process that takes a lot of holding things up, trying things out, and moving them around until you're happy with it. I used another obscene amount of hot glue to hold my little cabin down and started placing the trees, shrubs, and grasses, periodically testing to make sure the dome still fit over top. Then, again, because I can't help myself, I decided oh, my tiny people needed some tiny fuel for their tiny fire, so I cut up some toothpicks to make tiny logs. I glued these into place alongside the house in an untidy pile. Next, I decided to add a little more flocking around the base of the trees to cover the hard edge and make the transition look more natural. I realized that I didn't quite have enough space to make a full forest under my little dome, so I ended up with just the two trees and a lot of shrubberies. A shrubbery! This is the kind of project that I particularly love, because there's really no end to how much grass and fake plants you can add to it. I mean, I suppose there is an end, but, but you can really just kind of go ham on it, because you'll probably run out of the need to glue on tiny bushes and grass before it starts to get to be too much. After another test fit of the dome, I realized that my trees were indeed some fairy leafy boys and needed to be pruned a little bit to fit into their new plastic home. grateful I did not include the scraping sound the wire tree branches made as I shut the dome down on top of them. I took my wire cutters and started giving these thick boys a haircut. Because life is so much richer with an element of danger, I made sure to aim the wire I was cutting directly at my unprotected face. I was lucky, but you should wear safety glasses. After I had successfully trimmed as much as I dared, I settled the dome back over top and twisted it until it met the broken edge still glued to the base. I was shocked at how good it was looking. That is until I turned the light on and realized I had a huge gap at the base of the house and you could see the whole LED bulb sticking up through the ground. Fortunately, stairs had the potential to look good and not out of place, so I cut up some more toothpicks and, with the tree blocking the shot, coerced those itty bitty pieces of wood in front of the doorway. Trust me, it worked perfectly. Finally, after all the faffing about, it was time to scooch the dome back down and roll the glamour shots.
If you enjoyed this video, give it a like, subscribe, and turn on notifications so you can see more stuff that I make when I upload new videos on Fridays. I hope you're having a fabulous day, and thanks for spending part of it with me. Bye!